Lord, may the words be exactly what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Would you do that with me right now? Just give him praise. We're so glad that you're all here today. And um, we want to give a word of thanks to our praise team. Would you join me in just thanking them for leading us in worship today? It's very beautiful. I know it touched my heart, and I'm sure it touched yours as well. You know, they, they make it look easy, but that's a lot of work, and they put a lot of time and preparation into that. I, uh, I've asked them a couple times to let me be in the praise team, and they won't let me in. Uh, I said, you know, I could sing, and they said, no, you can't sing. And I said, well, I could play the guitar, and they said, no, you can't. They will not. It's kind of like a prejudice thing or discrimination maybe, right? They won't let pastors in the praise team. I don't know. So I appreciate them and the work that they do. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful day that God has given us to worship Him outside in His great outdoors. This is the beauty of God's creation. Just a little, our little slice that He's given us, and we're very thankful for it. And it's a blessing just to be outdoors and spread out and, and uh, worship Him in, in this kind of a beautiful setting. And I'm so glad that you're here. Obviously, today is a very special day in our church calendar because we're celebrating our 61st anniversary as a church. Now, someone put out 62. I don't know who that was. I have no idea who te uh, texted yesterday, 62 years. It might have been me, it might not have been me, but it's actually 61 years. And 61 years ago, uh, and I'm, I'm very thankful for Lake Hills Baptist Church, and we're going to talk a little bit about our history and heritage today, but we're just so glad that you're here uh, to worship, uh, worship with us today. And I want to mention a, real quickly a couple of things going on. And, and while I do that, let me just say, you know, the sun is coming out, and I guess it's just going to keep coming over. It tends to do that. So if you're in the sun too much and you want to move over here to the shady area, uh, you're welcome to do that. You're not going to bother me if you do that, you know, uh, right now. But maybe later on, it might bother me. I don't know. Uh, there's a little bit of sun, so you're welcome to move over if, if that's better for you. Go, uh, go right ahead. Now, let me just say that today, we're, we're giving thanks to God. We're in fellowship with one another, and we're celebrating. And so besides uh, the beautiful worship and the message from God's Word, we have the bounce house in the back for all of our younger children. And um, it, you're welcome to enjoy that. We would ask the parents that you would stay close and you would monitor your own children. We're only allowed like uh, five or six or eight or ten kids in there at a time. So you can, maybe 20, I don't know. There's a sign over there that talks about it. And ten kids, I think, is the limit. So you parents, if you would help monitor uh, your child and the safety of your child and those kinds of things. Now we also have a food truck that's coming and they're going to have like... Uh, really delicious pulled pork because I've had it before and it is good. Uh, cheeseburgers, hot dogs, and those kinds of things at a nominal price. So we hope that you will stay and enjoy. We're going to have games set up. We're going to have volleyball set up. And it's just going to be a great day. The Lord's blessed us with beautiful weather. So we're glad that you're here to be a part of it. You know, I, I was thinking of Psalm, um, Isaiah 25 where it says, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name in for the perfect faithfulness that you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. And now I think about that and I think about our church that, you know, this was a, a plan of God's that, that many, many years ago. And, you know, I think of, um, you know, about 62 years ago, it would have been about 62 years ago, there was a gentleman by the name of Leroy Boken, and he was driving through the Lake Hills area, and, and you might have heard of a Boken Funeral Home. Well, that was a Leroy Boken, and he was a member of Calvary Baptist Church in Highland, and he was driving through this area, and he saw that, you know, this is a, a popular, there were houses going in, and there were children out playing, and he said, you know, he thought to himself, there needs to be a church in this area, because there wasn't one. And he... Uh, he wasn't a pastor, he wasn't a missionary, he wasn't a church planter. He was a, a, a church member, a Christian, just like you and I. But he went back to his church and he shared a vision, an idea, really. At that point, it was just an idea. What if we helped to plant a church over in that next little uh, out, uh, village over there in Lake Hills? What if we could do something about it? And, 
And of course, uh, the rest is history, right? Because Calvary Baptist Church in, in 1960, uh, they, they built a little building out there, and it's still part of our worship center. In the back of the worship center, that overflow area, if you look at it carefully, that used to be the original uh, sanctuary. And it was faced north and south, not like it does now, but uh, those doors that go into the overflow area, those were the front doors of the worship center uh, those many years ago. And, you know, faithful people of God and others who came to know Christ, they all partnered together. They actually coveted together as a church membership, and they formed Lake Hills Baptist Church. And, you know, we could uh, mention a few names that you would still recognize because some of them, you know, may be here today, and they're certainly a part of our church family still. Uh, fellas like Buzz Oles. Uh, now, Buzz, is, he's got white hair. Is Buzz here? I'm going to talk about him a little bit. He's a great guy, and I love Buzz. He's got white hair, and, and um, he, he doesn't get around as well as he used to. He was a teenager. He was a young, strapping teenager when uh, the church was started those many years ago. And I think of, like, Shirley and Linda Tucker, and Shirley Chapman and Linda Budak. They were some of those early church members and founding members, Valerie Bowler, and who's now Valerie Califf. And, and then there were families that came to the area, who quickly, in the early days, joined the church. People like uh, the Nuss family, Harry and Jean Nuss, and O'Hara and Fran Jones, and, and people like uh, Bruce Young and his uh, parents, and Matilda Fitzpatrick, and uh, Jim McKinley. You know, I don't know if you guys all know this or not, but uh, Jim McKinley went home to be with the Lord just a couple of weeks ago. And so we want to be praying for, I think, Michelle and... Her family are going to come. They're, his daughter is going to come visit us in a couple of weeks. And we just want to uh, express to her and all of the family our condolences. But, you know, there's other families that were added on and joined the church and came to the church over the years. And I think of some that, you know, uh, have gone home to be with the Lord. And uh, longtime members, Bonnie Sherman, just recently, right? And it's a blessing to have... Jim in our service today, and Jim, we love you, and we're praying for you, and praying for God's uh, healing grace and peace in your heart, and in all of your family as well, and we think of uh, Dave Wells, and Matilda Fitzpatrick, and Jack Grady, and Mick Newman, and Rich Barris, and we could go on and on and on, people that, you know, many of us knew and loved, and that we miss deeply, and they are a part of the rich heritage of Lake Hills Baptist Church. You know, I was thinking of our church, and I was thinking of uh, a church in the New Testament that I really uh, love reading about and just really blesses me, and that was the church at Thessalonica. You know, we see in the New Testament there the first and second letters of Thessalonians that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. And, um, and I want us to talk a little bit about the church at Thessalonica this morning. You know, they... Um, Paul went on his missionary journeys, didn't he? And he planted churches. And his first missionary journey, he was in Asia Minor. And if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. And if you have your, your hard copy print Bible, if you look in the back, you can find a map, probably, that has Paul's missionary journeys. And it was on his second missionary journey. You know, the first one, he was in Asia Minor and at Ephesus and, and um, you know, the Galatia area, and he started some churches there in his early trip. His second trip, you might remember that he uh, had a vision, and the man from Macedonia, read about that in the book of Acts, and he, and he saw in his this dream this person that was calling him to come to Macedonia. We need the gospel over here. And so he, uh, that was the Spirit of God leading him, and so he was obedient, he went Across the Aegean Sea, it is, and he crossed over to Philippi, and he, you know, great name, I love the name of that city, you know, Philippi comes from Philippi. Right? not funny. <laughs> Philip was, uh, some of you guys that um, really have your ancient history down, you may correct me on this, if I'm not mistaken, and I might be. Philip was the father of Alexander the Great. Is that true? Is that right? Am I right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And um, so Philippi, 
who was named after, uh, you know, Alexander the Great's father. And Paul went there and preached the gospel. And you, there's other towns in, uh, in Macedonia that you'll recall, like um, Berea. And then Paul went down to Thessalonica. And Thessalonica, if you read 1 Thessalonians, you know, it's a beautiful story of a church that was planted and flourished really out of the pure darkness of idolatry. Paul went there and he started that church and he loved those people. He loved the way that uh, their hearts had been converted from idols to the true and living God, the Bible says, and how their lives were transformed. And, but, the, the, you know, if you remember about Paul, he faced persecution almost everywhere he went, right? And so he had only been in Thessalonica a short time when uh, there was persecution. And he literally had to flee for his life. He'd only been there a few months, perhaps, starting this church. And there were these young believers that he basically had to abandon and leave. And they didn't go far, but they, they got out of town. And, and they were thinking about this young church, worried about this young church. Are they going to be with able to withstand the persecution and those kinds of things. And, and so he was very concerned about them. And so he wrote, he actually sent Timothy back into that area to visit them and to encourage them and to establish them. And he wrote this letter of 1 Thessalonians. And um, it's, a, it's a book about a Christ's second coming. It's a book about being faithful. It's a book about being holy. It's a book about prayer. And, and it's, it's a book that, um, about encouragement, because he wrote to encourage them. You know, the word encourage, and we're going to talk this, today about the power of encouragement as a church family. The power of encouragement, the power that you uh, wield in, in encouraging others. The word encouragement means to give courage to someone. And what oxygen is to the lungs, encouragement is to the soul. And, you know, sometimes we can, uh, you know, some people, they all they see is problems. And, you know, sometimes we can fall into the trap of being just a little bit too negative. You know, it reminds me, uh, I hunt a little bit, and I mostly, you know, sit out in the woods. I'm not, I don't do a lot of killing, you know, but I do, I do go out there. And it's kind of, it reminds me of the story of the fellow who had this, you know, this new duck hunting dog that he was so proud of. And this was a special dog. Matter of fact, he took this dog out one time, the first time, and he, you know, he shot a duck or whatever, and, and the dog literally walked on the water out to the lake to pick up the duck and walked back on top of the water. That's a pretty special dog, right? So he took his friend out, and, um, you know, they were shooting. You know, he's like, my new dog, you know, he's a special dog. You'll see. You're going to really like him. And, and so they shot their first duck, and this dog, right in front of this fella and his friend, he walks on top of the water out to pick up this duck, and he comes back, and, and the, the other, his friend didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. And the guy's like, man, he's not in front. He, I can't, you know, this dog just walked on water. And he said, what do you think of my dog? Did you see that? And he said, yeah, he can't swim worth a lick. <laughs> Some people, you know, someone told me one time that, even if you found a cure for cancer, some people wouldn't like it. They wouldn't be happy about it, right? Because sometimes we can just fall into that negativity. It seems like everywhere right now in our world today, there are discouraging words everywhere you go. But Paul was an encourager. And he, uh, I want us to read here, and we're going to read in chapter 3. And, uh, you know, I wish we could read the whole book, but... Um, we're going to read here in chapter 3, his words to his friends at uh, Thessalonica. Now really, you know, this book of Thessalonians, it's really a book about ministry. Because Paul writes about how to minister to others. And you can read it in the second chapter. He says, first of all, you want to care for them, just like a mother cares for her young children. You care about people. You're sensitive. You're, uh, here's a word for you to go home and look up and build into, not your, just your vocabulary, because you've heard the word before, but to build into your personality. He said, I cared for you as a nurturing mother cares for her little children. The word nurture. That we would learn 
to be a nurturing kind of a person, right? Where you care for people, you're, in, you're nurturing, you're, you're cultivating a sense of warmth and love and affection toward them. Paul said, that's the way I cared for you. But then he goes on and he said, but I also encouraged you as a loving father. So I could speak into your life. I could offer you words of wisdom in a, in a gracious manner. And I, want, I encourage you in that way. And, um, and then he mentions prayer, that I have prayed for you. And we're going to look at prayer later in one of our points. But, so caring for people encouraging people and praying for people that's how paul discipled these believers in thessalonica now you know you may not have a seminary degree and that's okay you may not be a preacher and that's okay but every person here today you can care about people you can encourage people and you can pray for people and that because you can do those three things you can minister to other people now, it, it starts right in your own home, right? You can care about the people in your house that live in your house. You can encourage the people that live in your house. You can pray for the people that, and when you do that, and Paul was like, he was overjoyed at the spiritual growth and development of these believers. Let's read, now we're, we're talking about the encouraging part today. That's what we're going to kind of focus on here in our time together. So we're going to begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. And here it says right here, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. We sent Timothy to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. So he said when we could no longer endure it, what was he enduring? He was, in, he was beside himself, worried and concerned about these believers who he had no communicate, no email, no cell phone signal, none of that. They had just been gone for, for several weeks and perhaps months. And in his mind, he's like, how are they doing? Are they holding together as a church? There's persecution over there. Have they given up on the faith? He said, I, I, was, I couldn't take it anymore. So I had to send Timothy to check on you guys and to encourage you guys. And he did. Paul couldn't go himself because it would have cost him his life. Right? He, he, it wasn't safe enough for him to go. He sent Timothy. And then um, verse 3, it says, uh, why was his concern about that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. Now, in their day, their afflictions that might have uh, caused these believers to quit was uh, persecution. You know, they were arresting them. They were putting them in jail. They were losing their livelihoods, their jobs. But, you know, I think we can translate today that there are certain afflictions going on in our society. The world seems like it's turned upside down in many respects, doesn't it? And, and so how are these afflictions going to affect, affect us or not? And how is our faith going to endure and um, survive in the midst of these things? And we all need encouragement in that area. He goes on and he says in verse 4, he um, you know, we told you beforehand that we were going to suffer tribulation, just as it has happened. And you know. And for this reason, he says it again, I could no longer endure it. I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might have been in vain. He said, I was, I was afraid that you guys had quit on God. Because of all the things you were, the afflictions that you were going through. So I sent to know your faith. And he says now he's already got the result back in verse 6. He said, Timothy came back to us and brought us good news that your faith and love, about your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, and we want to see you also. And then he says in verse 7, he says, Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. So it, it helped us to know that you're doing well, that you're maintaining 
uh, faithful and committed in your faith and in your love for one another. For now, verse 8, for now we live. If you stand fast in the Lord, for what thanks we can render to God for you. We're giving thanks to God for you. For all of the joy which we have, we rejoice for your sake before God. Not, and then he goes on, he closes in verse 10. He says, night and day, we're praying for you exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now, um, the word encourage means to give courage to. It is, uh, here, here's a trivia question. Can you think of someone in the Bible that was known for encouragement? Like their name means encouragement? Barnabas, right? Barnabas, uh, if you remember Barnabas, he was, you know, one of Paul's colleagues and really one of Paul's mentors. He was the first person who believed in Paul, right? And his real name was Joseph. But no one, if I said, you know, Joseph that ran around with Paul, you wouldn't know who I was talking about. Because he was known by his nickname, which was Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So, when, um, so what would be your nickname? What would be my nickname if we were called by our attitudes and our actions? What would it be? Would it be encourager, helper, teacher, servant? Would it be kindness? Or would it be something not quite so positive? Would it be like a grumpy? You know, it's like the one who said, you know, do you wake up grumpy? And, and she said, no, I let him sleep. Right? <laughs> I don't wake him up. Is your nickname grumpy? Or is it uh, stingy? Or is it gossiper? Or is it, I don't know. You know, that's just something to think about. If we're known by our, our characteristic and our behavior and our attitude. You know, it takes courage to be an encourager. And in this passage, I want to share with you three statements that Paul used uh, to encourage these struggling believers. And they are three statements that you and I can use to encourage one another as a church family. Or in our own family, our own circle of relationships in your home, at school, at work, at church. The first one is, you may be struggling, but don't give up. You may be struggling, but don't quit. Don't quit on God. Don't quit on your faith. Don't quit on your relationships. It says here in verse 2, it says, uh, you know, Paul sent Timothy, and he sent him to establish you and encourage you that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. So we're going through afflictions, maybe in your life, maybe in our world. And, and they're real. You know, you can't deny them. You know, sometimes we wish we could, but, but however you paint them, however you choose to uh, focus them in or frame them, the reality is they're there. Our world is not as normal as it, whatever normal is, right? You know, I, I think we can identify with uh, the greatest generation of our country, the World War II generation, when they were going through, you know, times of upheaval and turmoil. I think on some level we can identify with our parents who lived through, and some of you, you know, not your parents, some of you, who lived through the 1960s and the civil rights uh, movement and the Vietnam War and, and the chaos that was going on in our world and our society. I think on some level, I'm not comparing or stacking, you know, uh, comparing stacks, I'm just saying there is some similarity that there is a lot of, of, you know, he uses the word afflictions, turmoil, problems, and he said, don't be shaken by those things. Don't allow the, the misinformation, the, the controversy, uh, the, uh, the disagreement, the, the conflict, don't allow all those things to cause you to give up on your faith or to give up on your church or to give up on God. Don't quit. That's exactly what he's saying. Life is full of trials and tribulations and certainly Christians are not exempt. Paul actually says in verse 4, he said, I told you these kind of things were going to happen. And so when people go through tough times, God wants us to come alongside of them and to encourage them. 
That, that's what we need to do as a church family. You know, I mean, you can't get a very big group of people. It doesn't have to be a big group of people before you start coming into different sorts of diversity, right? Uh, I mean, you know, in a group of 300 people, I mean, first of all, there's male and female. That's the obvious, right? And, and then there's old and young. There's different races. There's different political persuasions. There's different, different, di I mean, listen, I'm from the South, y'all. And, you know, North, South, whatever it is. You know, some of you are from Illinois, but we love you anyway. You know, you're still welcome here. You know, you, I'm kidding, but you know what I'm saying. And, and so what we have to do is don't allow these secondary matters to, um, the Holy Spirit is just emphasizing what I'm about to say right now. Don't allow the world's problems to divide the people of God. And, and you say, well, how can we do that? Because these are some like, it's called graciousness. It's called grace. And we're going to give each other grace to think a little bit differently about some of these superfluous matters. Okay? I, I am going to minimize the, 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 the things that are going on in our society in light of God and eternity. Now, they, they, I'm not, they're serious. They are serious. I'm not, but in light of God and eternity? Listen, my friend. When you're in heaven one day, and you've been there for 10,000 years, you're not still going to be all worked up about a vaccine or uh, you know, a political movement or who was president. <laughs> my friend, that is the last thing you're going to worry about is who was president of one little nation that had, a, you know, like this, 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 you know, a few centuries uh, run in the grand scheme of eternity. <laughs> that is not going to be a topic of conversation, my friend. So let's not make a, a mountain out of a molehill. No, I'm not, I'm not minimizing. I'm just saying in light of God and eternity and what binds us together. What binds us together is so much greater than what's going on out there in the world right now. And let's not lose sight of that, my friend. Because I don't want anyone to quit over those kinds of things. Can they be discouraging? Yes, we are to encourage one another. You know, the other day I... Um, this is something that doesn't happen a lot anymore, but, you know, I jumped someone's off on their car. Their car battery was dead, and and uh, it used to be, you know, everybody carried jumper cables in their car, and, and we we carry them in my wife's car, but, you know, you know, I go years without using them, right? Have you ever jumped someone off, right? Because their car won't start. Their battery is dead. So what do you have to do? You have to get your battery that has energy and you come alongside of them. You know the word encourage? Do you know what it is in the Greek? It's the word parakaleo, which is the same word as paraclete, which is uh, in the New Testament, you know, in the Gospel of John, right? We all are familiar with paraclete. That's the comforter that would come, right? Jesus said, it's better for me to go away. I can send you the comforter. That word is paraclete. Parakaleo means to comfort or to encourage. So you bring your car alongside of their car, and you have energy in your battery, and you give them a little bit of your energy so they can get started. Okay? That's encouragement. Encouragement just means that today, you happen to have a little bit more energy, whereas today, someone like Jim Sherman, or uh, the Pratt family, or someone else may not have quite enough energy to get going. And so what do you do? You come alongside of them and you just give them a little boost. That's exactly what Paul is telling us to do. That's exactly what he and Timothy sought to do with the church at Thessalonica. And um, it, it could be in your own household, your own family members. It could be deacons or pastors or husbands and wives or or friends, or teachers and volunteers. You know, people gravitate towards encouragers. Someone well said, flatter me, and I may not believe you. 
Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. But encourage me, and I will never forget you. It's a powerful thing. And Paul wrote that he was concerned that the tempter would tempt them to give up. So I want to say to all of us here, whether it's a loss in your life, perhaps you've lost some of your health, you've lost a loved one, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever we're going through, whatever the afflictions are, Paul's word, don't give up on your faith. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on relationships. Don't quit. Now, I want to give you an assignment, and then I'm going to go on to our, our next point here. This is your assignment. Will you have the courage to encourage? Ask the Holy Spirit. This is your assignment. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your mind someone who is struggling. They need to be encouraged. And then you make a mental commitment to go alongside of them and to encourage them. You know, I think of, uh, you know... Uh, the Van Burens, the Shermans, uh, Lori Hamilton just lost her mom. I just lost my dad. And, you know, it's kind of like um, a lot of that going on right now. But that's why we need a lot of encouragement going. Now, here's the second statement that Paul made to encourage. The first one was, don't quit. Even though you're going through these uh, afflictions, don't quit. The second one is, even though you may feel isolated, I am thankful for you. He says in verse 9, for what thanks we can render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before God. So my heart fills with joy and gratitude when I think about you. I am thankful for you. So one of the best ways to encourage someone is to tell him or her that you are thankful for them. You know, I would tell I want to tell you all the wives here today, sometime this weekend, don't do it today because you're going to think, oh, yeah, it's because Pastor Phil said it, right? <laughs> it doesn't count. <laughs> sometime this week, uh, just, you know, drag up in your soul all the sincerity you can muster and sincerely thank your husband for being faithful, for being a good provider, for loving you and loving your children. Thank him for being uh, who he is. And vice versa. And um, Paul modeled this encouragement when he wrote these words. I give thanks to God for you. Sometimes people can feel alone, or they can feel overlooked or unappreciated. You know, I, I uh, did you guys uh, remember uh, about a month ago, we were Church of the Week. We were the Shine.fm Church of the Week. Remember that? You don't remember. Raise your hand if you remember that. I wasn't even here, and I remember. <laughs> what you may not remember, because it didn't quite come off like I wanted it to, because I, I just think the, you know, I don't know. On the plaque, the, the award that they gave us, and we need to put it in the main building so you guys can all see it. It's beautiful. It says Lake Hills Baptist Church, and then it has someone's name on it. You remember whose name it was? You don't remember, do you? Does anybody remember whose name it was? Justin. Billy Joe Young. It was Billy Joe Young. So they told us, when they chose us for Church of the Week, they said, you can dedicate the award in honor of someone. And immediately, I thought, Billy Joe Young. Not only is she a rich part of the heritage and history of our church, she knows everybody. She knows everybody who comes here and everybody who used to come here. Everyone who ever thought about coming here, she knows them. And, um, but she is someone who just dedicates time and energy and she just wants to help people. And I don't know if she's here. I'm not going to ask if she's here because she'll get mad at me for embarrassing her or whatever. I don't know. But uh, she's a person that I personally want to thank and appreciate that can often maybe go un overlooked. I, I'll tell you, I'm going to mention uh, one other, it's a couple, but um, and that's Rex and Jean Kelly. Because Rex and Jean have been faithful members of our church for decades and decades, and Rex 
has been this faithful greeter at the South Foyer door in first service, him and Ed Winkas, for years and 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 years. He's not young, okay? He's been there a while. And I appreciate Rex and his faithfulness so much. And, you know, all of our greeters, they do a great job. But sometimes we just need to remember to give a big thank you to the people in our lives. And, you know, it might be just a word of thanks and maybe a, an example of how they bless you. It might be a, a thoughtful gesture, a small gift, or, um, you know, a favor that you can do for them or some way to bless them, whatever it may be. You know, it was, uh, to, quote, to quote that very famous theologian, Mary Kay, <laughs> I'm kidding. Mary Kay was a believer, and uh, she's not. She's not living, is she, Kathy? I don't think she's living anymore. Uh, Mary Kay, uh, she donated tons of money to her church and to uh, Christian work. But she said these words. She said, "Pretend that every single person you meet has a sign on his or her neck that says." make me feel important and she says and if you do that you will succeed in life she wasn't actually in sales even though she was she was actually all about people and helping people succeed <clears throat> if you just see every person as if they had a sign around their neck make me feel important and then you seek to do that in sincerity and in love just to bless them you will be successful in life. Now, here's your next assignment. This is your second assignment, and we're going to rush on. Your second assignment is to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your mind someone that you need to say thank you to, that you need to be thankful for. And then text them. Send them a message or send them a card or just say it to them. Uh, tell them personally or whatever the case may be. And that will, uh, because someone out there, perhaps feels isolated or unappreciated, and they need to be encouraged. Now, here's the last one. Uh, the last statement that Paul used to encourage these believers, first of all, he said, uh, I know you're going through a hard time. Don't quit. And then he said, um, I know you feel isolated, but I am thankful for you. And then thirdly, he said, you may feel weak, but I am praying for you. I am praying for you. And he says that in verse 10. He says, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now, we're going to read his prayer. I mean, he actually put the prayer that he prayed for these Thessalonians. He put it right in the text. And we're going to read it in just a moment if we don't run out of, run out of time. And, and, and he says, night and day, I've been praying for you. And um, I'm praying for you. And he says, uh, don't give up during your trials. He was thankful for them, and now he tells them that he's praying for them. You know, I remember, uh, he says night and day, praying exceedingly. Now, that, that sounds a little serious, doesn't it? That's just not, you know, we're giving thanks for our food. And, and oh, yeah, Lord, please bless the missionaries too, right? That's not that kind of prayer. This is like day and night, exceedingly. And... Um, so when you need to see something happen in your world, in the people that you love and care about, pray for them. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Pray exceedingly day and night. You know, when you pray for other people, that's called intercessory prayer. That, that's, what, that's what we call it. It's called intercessory. You're interceding, interceding to God on their behalf, on the behalf of a different person. You know, sometimes we... You know, typically we pray Polly want a cracker kind of prayers, right? You just go to God, you know, God, I want this, and, you know, I want a cracker, I want a cracker, I want a cracker, right? And certainly, prayer is asking, and there's nothing wrong with asking, but, you know, uh, intercessory prayer is asking for others. It's really, I don't know if you think about this, it's really kind of a very sincere a disinterested kind of pray. Because you are praying, you're taking the time to pray and, and plead to God and go before God, but you're doing it for someone else. Uh, I remember years ago when I was in college, um, I just, I just, this burden came over me. 
You know, I was, I was a freshman in college. My brother, my brother Frank, how many of you know my brother Frank? You know my brother? He's a pastor out in Oregon. He's coming to visit us in October, the end of October, and, and he'll be here in our services. And I know uh, he used to be on staff at Lake Hills Baptist Church. He used to be the youth pastor. My brother did before Pastor Adam was the youth pastor. I know most of you know that, but you may not. Some of you may not. And so he uh, he's a part of that heritage, too, uh, of Lake Hills, and, and he's going to be visiting us. But anyway, when he was in high school, he was not a pastor. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even close to being a pastor, okay, if you get my drift. And when I was in college, uh, now see, I, I was like a pastor. I was born an adult. <laughs> Literally, man, it's like my life's scary. I went from being 10 to being 35 in like one year. I was the most boring teenager you have ever seen in your life. You know, I made old people look exciting. That's how boring I was. So we were a lot different. So when I was in college, I had this burden for my brother and my sister. They were older, they were a little bit older than me, but I was spiritually burdened for them. And you know what I did? I, uh, I did what this verse said. I began praying night and day. And every night, about 8 o'clock, before I would go to bed, I would go outside. And there was these little, tr there was little trees, kind of like our prayer trail. It's kind of like, you know, not a big area, it wasn't, you know, it's just a little area. And I would go out in those trees. And I would just pray. I would pray out loud. And uh, it, was good, it was, you know, it was kind of windy and cold. There was no one else out there, which was probably a good thing. I would pray out loud, and I was just crying out to God for my brother and my sister. And I was just praying for them. And I did that probably not every night of the week, but very often for weeks and weeks and weeks, probably three or four nights a week, I was out in those trees for about, I don't know, 30 minutes or an hour. Just praying to God. And really, all I asked him for was my brother and my sister. Now, I, I'm not here to lift up myself because, you know, I don't answer prayer. You know, God does according to his own will. All I know, you know, and certainly that was, the, that was the spirit of God who laid that burden on me, right? It wasn't anything to do with me. All I know is that a year later, my brother... It was really that same year, later that year, my brother rededicated his life to the Lord. <laughs> he surrendered to preach, and he marched his little self off to Bible college. Right? And it was like night and day from where he was headed to where he ended up. And if you know someone who's discouraged, or maybe they're getting off track, or maybe they're being distracted by the world, or whatever the case may be, you can encourage them by praying for them. Tell them you're praying for them. You know, those are the scariest words that you can ever say to some people, right? If you say you're praying for me, I'm like, you know, keep it up. I need it. But there's some people, you make them very awkward and nervous if you were to tell them, hey, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. They don't know how to take that. <laughs> but that's probably a good thing. That, you know, that's probably a good thing. And you pray for them exceedingly, night and day. And you just step back. When you pray exceedingly, night and day, for someone else besides yourself, you just step back and watch what God does. You watch what He does. We could read His prayer. It's in verses 11 through 13. He basically said, Really, it's the theme of the book of Thessalonians is what he was praying for them. He said that, God, I'm asking God to fill you with love. I'm asking God to strengthen your heart and make you faithful. And then he said, I'm asking God to make you holy and ready for his return. Blame, blameless and holy. So if you want to pray for someone, maybe it's your brother. Maybe it's your child. Maybe it's your teenager. I don't know who it is. Pray for this. Pray that the Lord will fill them with his love. If they could just understand how much they are loved by God, 
it would change their lives. It would change the way they see the world, right? Ask God that he would strengthen their heart and their faith, that he would make them strong in spirit, mighty in spirit, and great in faith. Pray that for the person you know that has almost zero faith. Maybe they don't even have faith. Ask God to give them mighty faith and pray exceedingly night and day. And then ask God to make them holy and ready for his return. Now, I'll... Uh, I want to. I want to close, and we're we're done. Is the truck over there? I don't smell a barbecue yet, so I think I have a couple. Of, did you guys smell anything good cooking yet? But can you smell it though? I want the aroma. <laughs> That's how you know it's dinner time, right? Ooh, the smell calls us over to the food truck. Um, now I forgot what I was going to say. I'm kidding. I didn't. <laughs> When you uh, read the book of 1 Thessalonians, it, it's all about growing in God's love, growing in faithfulness, and being growing in holiness to be ready for Christ's return. You know Christians should be concerned about our holiness? Every teenager in this room, in this room, <laughs> every teenager out here, you should be concerned about your holiness. And, and going through your teenage years, Maybe a little bit boring, maybe under some people's definition, but a little bit holy so that you don't have to live with a lifetime of regret. You just think, oh man, I really I really blew that. What in the world was I thinking? Oh, I'm, I regret that. I'm sorry I did that. You can avoid a lot of that. Anyway, that's a message for a different day. And, and, and it's all about Christ's return. You know, uh, Thessalonians is... This is how bad the persecution was, okay? They, Paul, in the short time he was with them, he had taught them all about Christ, and he taught them about Christ's second coming, and what it would be like, and what the world would be like. Their persecution was so intense, they thought they were in the middle of the tribulation. That's how bad it was. And they were concerned that Christ had already come, and they had missed it. That's how intense the persecution, that's how upside down the world was. Can, I, can anyone relate to that? Has anyone in the last year and a half asked yourself, Christ must be coming soon, right? It's like the meme I saw over a year ago, and it's so true. It was like the lady was looking down the highway, and she says, I'm looking to see what chapter of Revelation is today. And that's the way it's been. So you feel like Christ must be coming. And you know what? He is coming. He is coming. And 1 Thessalonians is about that. There's three prayers in 1 Thessalonians. One at the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. And they're really keys to understanding each portion of the book. And this is the middle prayer here in chapter 3. And he was praying that they would be filled with God's love, that they would be strengthened in their faith, and they would be ready and holy for Christ's return. Now, some of you are saying, and, I, and I'm done, some of you are saying that, Pastor Phil, that's great about encouraging others. And with God's help and the Holy Spirit uh, prompting me, I'm going to seek to do that. But Pastor Phil, you really kind of missed it because I'm the one who needs encouraged. <laughs> I'm the one who's got a dead battery, right? I, I get that. You know, and, and sometimes you have to encourage others while you're waiting to be encouraged. Now, that may not seem fair, but it's kind of that way sometimes. And I'll tell you this about encouragement. It's kind of like a boomerang, right? Have you ever owned a, a you know what a boomerang is, right? They're, they're from down under, right? And, and it's kind of a weapon. It's a hunting instrument. And it's kind of like the fellow that he bought a new boomerang. But he couldn't do anything with his old one because he kept throwing it away. <laughs> boomerang, you, you throw it out. About 50 yards, and I used to have a boomerang when I was a kid. I haven't thought about that in years. They are really cool because you throw it out and it comes right back to you, right? That's how boomerang works. That's how encouragement works. You 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 give it out to others, and somehow it comes right back to you. Maybe from a different direction, but it comes back to you. So I want to encourage you. To be encouragement to others. And you know what? You will find yourself being encouraged. Let's bow together for prayer.
just with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. The wonderful thing about these believers is how they came to Christ. Their lives were in darkness. They were far from God. But when they heard the good news of Jesus Christ, oh, it was like it was like a refreshing drink of water. It was such a blessing that they could be forgiven and they could have new life. And they could have God, the true and living God, in their life in a personal way. And I wonder if there's anyone here today, and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. Oh, my friend, I want you to know, He is in the business of transforming lives. And when our lives feel defeated, and they feel dark, and we, we're filled with despair or discouragement, oh, my friend, the Lord Jesus Christ, He is the true and living God. And he, he loves you so much that he died on a cross to pay for your sins and your wrongs. And if you will believe in him and invite him into your life, he will be your savior. He will come into your life and he will be your God. And, and you just read the Thessalonians and how their lives were turned uh, into such a positive force because of Jesus coming into their life. There may be someone here today, and you need to invite Jesus Christ into your life. Lord, I pray that you would. I invite you to ask him, believe in him, and ask him to come into your heart and to be your Savior. You can do that right at this very moment. <coughs> and of course, there are many, many others of us, and we stand in need of encouragement. My friend, one of the ways is by being an encouragement. It's that whole boomerang thing. And we can encourage others. And just like it affirmed that young church, it will affirm our church. Don't quit. I know there are afflictions. There's whatever you want to call them. They're there. Don't quit on God. Don't quit on your faith. Don't quit on your church. Don't quit. Because we're thankful for each and every person who makes up this church family. <coughs> And we are praying for each. We're praying for you. We're praying for you. And you're going to be an encouragement to others. Our Father God, we thank you today for 61 years of faithful ministry and of your goodness on this group of people. Father, we're thankful for how you have used us in some way to be a lighthouse in this community. And I pray that we will continue to be faithful and holy in a loving church family. That the love of God would be so strong in us that it would just overflow and spill out on the people that live right around our church. That they would sense that there is a people that love us. And it's because God loves us. Father, we pray that our church would continue to be an encouraging place and uh a nurturing place. And, and we pray, Father, for your richest blessings on our church family. We pray this and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing one more song before we're dismissed. Would you stand with me as we sing?